Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, the number of drug overdose deaths in America increased by nearly 30% from 2019 to 2020 and has quintupled since 1999. Nearly 75% of the approximately 92,000 drug overdose deaths in 2020 involve an opioid. Unfortunately, researchers have observed significant increases in substance use and drug overdoses in the United States since the COVID-19 pandemic was declared a national emergency in March of 2020. Indeed, over 100,000 drug overdose deaths occurred in the United States in 2021 alone. Nearly 90% of individuals in need of substance use disorder treatment didn't receive any. Once again, the COVID-19 pandemic served as a negative accelerant, presenting unique challenges for people with substance use disorders and those in recovery. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast from the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hederly with AHA Communications. In this podcast, Rebecca Chickie, Senior Director of Behavioral Health Services at the American Hospital Association, is speaking with Kimberly Wells, CEO of Pinewood Springs in Columbia, Tennessee. Pinewood Springs is a 60-bed mental health and wellness hospital, a joint venture with HCA Healthcare's TriStar Health and Maury Regional Medical Center. The hospital provides a broad range of inpatient and outpatient services to treat both adults and adolescents with mood, thought, and co-occurring disorders within a supportive and therapeutic environment. Prior to serving at Pinewood, Wells was Vice President of Operations and Ethics and Compliance Officer at TriStar Horizon Medical Center in Dixon, Tennessee, where she created a new care pathway for those in need of access to addiction recovery, integrating physical and substance use disorder services, while also strengthening community partnerships to create a full continuum of care. This work goes beyond the growth of volume and margin. It addresses the growth of a mindset. With this work, HCA is changing the culture on how substance abuse and mental health needs were incorporated into the care and improvement of human lives. They believe that face-to-face engagement, when the patient is most vulnerable, is the best way to plant the seed of hope and give the patient a path to post-hospitalization recovery care. This was a multi-tiered project that leveraged not only hospital stakeholders, but also engaged community resources. The executive team came together to assess the structure needed to build a care continuum to create a plan that could be effective and efficient for the community, hospital, and providers. Teams engaged with many additional stakeholders across different areas of expertise in data, safety, and care models. These engagements and resources helped inform best practices and build the business case for proposed changes. Kimberly, thank you so much for taking the time today to be with both the American Hospital Association and all of us listening on this podcast. I want to start today at the very beginning. It's always a good place to start. And that is, could you share with us, why did you start on your journey to improve access to substance use disorder services? That's not something that all organizations go on a journey to achieve. So tell me a little bit about the purpose and the background. Absolutely. I have had several years now um, my own journey in my healthcare profession. And for me, that started in behavioral health. I think coupled with that, we all know a family member or a friend or someone in our close circle who has been impacted by substance abuse and mental health. And as I started as a healthcare operations executive, those issues were more and more prevalent. We were seeing patients come to us for their medical needs, but it was obvious they were suffering from some sort of substance abuse, addiction, opioid, or mental health issue. And it was really a moment in time for the community I was living in. We came together as stakeholders and said, enough is enough. We're not doing enough for our community. What can we do differently to serve our patients better and in a much more holistic way? So you've shared the why, but now can I ask you to share the where? So this is a significant problem that has a multitude of uh, driving factors, as I know you well know. So where did you start and who was involved? 
this specific initiative started at a HCA facility in the Tressor Division located outside of Nashville, Tennessee. And it started with many of our stakeholders at the hospital level, most critically the CEO, operations, quality, nursing, our physician leadership, all involved at the table. And really um, with our medical director driving an initial part of the conversation, when you look at how our patients were coming to us for surgical needs and pain in the ED, we actually took a step back and said, are we part of the problem? Are we prescribing the right types of medications? Are there better ways to enhance surgical recovery that don't require opioids? So that was a lot of work that was already in place, but our group wanted to take that a step further. For those that may be already in addiction or in recovery and struggling and still needing some support. And so we gathered together as a division, as a hospital executive, and most importantly, we engage with community stakeholders, our legislators, and state teams that existed in this space all come together to start this conversation to say, we know what we're currently doing is not working. We're willing to try things differently, and we want to be at the front edge of that. So, Kimberly, one of the things that you mentioned early on is that often these individuals were seeking care in your hospital for other medical or surgical needs, and that at the same time, uh, they were presenting with substance use disorders. Many organizations across the country, primarily we've seen this change in to integrate physical and behavioral health services in the primary care settings. But it sounds like you identified the opportunity and the need to integrate physical and behavioral health in the either emergency room or in the acute inpatient care setting. Do I understand that correctly? And could you expand? So. What we were seeing was exactly what you're describing. You may have come in for a knee replacement. And historically, if you had high cholesterol or a heart failure issue, you would get also seen by a specialist for cardiology. And the pivotal point for us in changing this conversation was painting that systematic care, that full continuum care of the patient who came in for a knee surgery because they fell down. And the team was pausing to ask the broader question, well, why did they fall down? Why do they keep falling? Why do they fall off their porch? Why did they have that motor vehicle accident? Well, underlying, there was an alcohol disorder or a substance use disorder. And before, we would treat that knee, we would treat your trauma, and send you home. And this is the place where we really said, we have a responsibility as our hospital community leader and serving our patients, not just to treat your knee and then send you back out into our community because we're doing you a disservice. We wanted to treat the whole patient and get to the underlying reason. In the same way we were going to consult a cardiologist for you, we're now going to consult a mental health specialist or an addictionologist, someone who specializes in that aspect of your care, the same way we have historically relied on our traditional medical specialist. And it was really that framework that started to change the narrative. And that was important to get people to think more openly and to pause and have conversations outside of just that medical stabilization or acute need you had when coming to the ER or for your medical medical needs in a medical hospital. So Kimberly, that makes a great deal of sense. But I do think your program to integrate physical and behavioral health services in the inpatient setting, in the emergency room, is still the exception to the rule. And I suspect that some of that has to do with currently the lack of reimbursement, quite honestly, from a variety of health plans, um, including Medicare and Medicaid in many cases, to pay for integrated services. So how is this financially viable? And um, if it's not, How have you found the ability to continue this and in what form and shape? Yes, there's obviously significant opportunity from a reimbursement standpoint. One of the unique elements when you look at an ED department, we don't turn patients away. It doesn't matter your insurance, if you're funded, if you're self-pay, you have a need and you're going to be seen. And I think the differentiator for our program was that perspective, that those patients are coming to us regardless of their ability to pay. And so 
we were treating the person as a whole. And it was our job to go back to our community leaders, legislators, and stakeholders in those aspects to have those conversations, to talk about are there state dollars available, are there federal grants available, to think more innovatively in the space and doing our due diligence to find those partners who maybe historically haven't had that perspective in the private sector in addiction and mental health. The other element that I would say is the system I work for, I'm very fortunate that they see the importance to mental health, co-occurring disorders, behavioral health needs, substance abuse needs, and they are expanding their footprint across the nation from freestanding facilities to outpatient services, trying to bring our locations to where our patients are. And I think that's part of the differentiator. We have to think about how we are going to meet our patients where they are, where our community members are. If it's in a rural setting, if it's a place where the only access they have is to a virtual session, I think that's one benefit I have seen in my field in the mental health and behavioral health facilities. From the pandemic, we've been able to open up a wide variety of outpatient services virtually that previously wasn't there. And I hope that those federal funds remain because we have touched so many more lives in a broad, broad region that we would not have been able to without those telehealth capabilities and innovations that we've seen coming out of the pandemic. Fantastic. Now, if I recall correctly, you also said this started at what we would call a general medical surgical hospital, this initiative. But you're now the CEO of Pinewood Springs, which is a freestanding psychiatric hospital, also part of HCA. So can you tell me how you have strengthened or brought this program along with you in your new role and in your new community? Yes, I am very fortunate to be in my leadership position at Pinewood Springs. It's a brand new facility that sits between Huntsville and Nashville. And we're one of the only robust complex centers in a 125-mile stretch. And for me, that's very exciting because I get to challenge my team to say, how do we just not cover that region, but how do we go beyond that? And being connected with HCA allows us so many more connectivity points or access points, as I call them, with patient populations. And so we know as a medical system, we have large patient populations going to other hospitals for cardiology services, bariatric services, trauma, women's services, and underlying those primary medical needs. There are often those co-occurring either substance abuse or mental health barriers to their long-term care. And we've been able to take this lens of that continuum of care and multiple stakeholders coming to the table to that program. We've been able to launch several initiatives since I've onboarded with Pinewood Springs, specifically in our urgent care and cardiology space. I think I shared the story with you that we started with our LVAD and transplant selection committee at one of our large sister facilities. And it was such an exciting conversation to be at the table with surgeons and specialists and the nurse practitioners and the clinic staff saying, we know this patient maybe has a history of substance abuse, or this patient has a history of generalized anxiety disorder that's preventing their BMI to lower, to qualify them for the medical surgical need that they have. And I remember the very first meeting we had, we sat down and they were reviewing their patient cases and the nurse practitioner and the surgeons paused. And it was that exact example. They were reviewing their labs. They were reviewing their BMI. But to qualify for the next level of care through the LVAD and transplant progression for him, he had to lower his BMI. And the provider paused and looked up and said, he's not progressing his BMI. But that's because he's coming into my office for every visit tearful. He has a history of anxiety. He just lost his mother. He's going through a depression state that's preventing him to move through this medical pathway. And they paused and said, thank you for being here. And we were able to assess that patient and get them integrated to our portion of the care. So it didn't delay him. We had another patient similarly had a history of substance abuse, had been reluctant to seek care previously so he could progress and qualify for that next step of his care. He'd been going through this for months. He was supposed to have his LVAD procedure in last November. 
He got in with us a little over a month ago, started his initial treatment, made enough progress for the surgeons that as a young young man in his 30s who was supposed to have a, a, a very life-sustaining procedure last November but had continued to be delayed, entered our program and received his procedure just in the last couple of weeks. That is so fantastic. I mean, it you really are treating the whole person. So um, let's have a couple of other questions where we can inspire others to go on the same journey that um, you have led here. Um, and just be honest about beyond reimbursement, what do you see as the biggest barriers to launching and sustaining this kind of work? What are the key success elements to starting it? So what are the barriers and what are the key success elements? Absolutely. I think there's different barriers based on the different systems that we're looking at. So if you look at it from the medical provider side, some of those barriers are breaking our own stigma within the medical field, having providers who are engaged and believe in that continuum of care, that holistic approach of care, and wanting to bring a variety of stakeholders to be on that patient's care team. There's always time constraints. There's always staffing constraints. And getting them to just pause, to have that brief conversation, willing to try something differently, finding that right partner to pilot with. And when that happens, it is so quickly to see the positive outcomes it changes that narrative and changes that culture. But that barrier is finding that initial team that's willing to have conversations differently, willing to come together differently as a team and finding those right partners. I think the barrier I see on the patient side and the need side is similar in breaking that stigma that we often as a community are, are so okay with oh, I have knee pain, I'm going to start with physical therapy. I have knee pain, I'm going to get that injection. Or if I have knee pain, I'm going to seek that surgical intervention. And I hope and want that barrier to be removed for people and that stigma to be removed for those that that knee pain, you see that same pain, as I call it, in the mind and soul that needs taken care of the same way. And if you look at it in that same continuum, you can start with that that least invasive, the same way you do a physical therapist, you do an outpatient appointment, or you do the medication management. And maybe you need that inpatient stay to address that mind and soul pain the same way you would seek a surgical stay for that need. That's excellent and exceptional. I didn't say this earlier, but as you were describing uh, the two patients as examples of individuals that you have helped, I had a huge smile on my face because I think everyone listening to this podcast, that's how they would want to be treated, address all of the problems and improve outcomes, reduce the length of stay. And I say that in a broad definition, uh, the stay of getting back to full health, reducing how long that takes. So thank you for this. I'm going to wrap up now, but I'm going to ask you to share two to three things that you would want listeners to remember as they think about this podcast? Either something that you would inspire them to do, what would be the first steps, why this is important, whatever you think, what are the top two or three things you would like a listener to take away? I think the first thing I would say goes to both that patient or that friend or family member that has someone suffering from a mental health disorder or substance abuse disorder uh, seeking help and or that medical professional that's in the office, that's in the hospital, that's in the surgical suite, help us break the stigma. Break the stigma that it's okay to pause for the conversation internally as a medical team. Help us break the stigma to pause and have that conversation with yourself, with your spouse, with your child about really what those needs are. And as a step, I would say, find a way to be a part of that. Find a way to be a part of however you can contribute in your current role, in your current community. If that's asking the question with your clinical team, if that's volunteering with several of wonderful nonprofits that are out there for substance abuse and mental health, educate yourself, 
get involved with youth and education and the large initiatives that are happening in our education system for our teachers and our counselors, but also our students and our youth. Find a way to be a part of it. Find a way to be a part to break the stigma. And I always end with and share with everyone, if it's you yourself, or again, if it's that family member, that friend, that neighbor, it's okay not to be okay. And our job is to be here for you in that moment at your most vulnerable time. It's our job to be the expert. And I'm just asking people to engage and help us break that stigma so more people can find the help they need. Kimberly Wells, thank you so much for sharing your passion, your inspiration, and the work that you and HCA are doing to go beyond the four walls of the hospital, working to improve access to recovery through community partnerships and through integrating physical and behavioral health care. We are very grateful for your time and your energy. Thank you so much.